Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may have heard these words before, a gimme your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Of course, those words are associated with the Statue of Liberty. It, those words come from uh, Emma Lazarus, a, a sonnet she wrote called New Colossus. She wrote it in 1883 to raise money for the pedestal on which the Statue of Liberty now stands. And those words were so uh, were deemed so important that they're actually now on a bronze plaque that you can see when you go to, to visit the Statue of Liberty. You know, the Statue of Liberty was often seen as like an unofficial greeter of incoming Im immigrants to our country, uh, especially in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. In fact, you know, our country has often been referred to as the melting pot, you know, a place where a variety of people and cultures and individuals can assimilate into one nation, one people. In fact, in, in 1958, John Kennedy even referred to the United States as a nation of immigrants. Now, I'm not advocating a particular stance on immigration here. I, I don't want you to think that. I'm just giving you some history. Now, I would say that I think foreigners are more common than ever, really, in the United States. Of course, the English, the Spanish, the French settled here in the Americas and through their settlements came the United States. But after we became a country, then German and Swedish and Jewish and Asian and African people came over here. Now, some willingly and some unwillingly, right? And then Mexicans entered our country, some legally, some illegally. And of course, we know people from India and, and many other countries have become a part of the United States. And close to home here, we have Haitians that have settled in Springfield. And if we're to believe anything we've heard about the missing cats and dogs, Saul, I don't know, you better think twice about going to Springfield. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, our country's acceptance of foreigners, I think, has really come under challenge recently. And, and I think it's difficult to accept people who are different from us, people who look differently from us, who are think differently, talk differently, act differently. In order for us to become a cohesive one or whole, though, sacrifices have to be made by some people. And there are just many leaders and many citizens who, who aren't willing to really make those sacrifices. So today we're going to talk a little bit about why that may be. We continue our sermon series, Embrace Yet, and today our sermon is called Yet is Sacrificial. And I think the best place to start as we dig into this is the Garden of Eden, right? God, God's creation, it had no foreigners, right? Adam and Eve uh, and, and the triune God were, were one. They had a perfect relationship with one another. Adam and Eve's disobedience, though, of course, brought sin and separation into this world, and we see it right away. After they disobeyed God, the first thing they did is hide from him. So we see that separation, and they clothe themselves um, to not be embarrassed, let's say, uh, as they looked at one another. So it affected their relationship with God and their relationship with one another. You see, our sin, it often causes us to value ourselves and people who are like us but to fear and to reject and to devalue those who aren't like us. You see, sacrifice involves surrendering, right? Giving something up. And we're often not willing to do that. You know, we think, well, I'll sacrifice for my family, but I don't want to sacrifice for anybody else. I have to take care of myself. And that's often how we feel. But you know what? God tells us something different. In our first reading today from Deuteronomy 10, 
Um, I'd like to focus on verses 18 and 19. I'd like us to read it together. Now, if you brought your Bible, please feel free. Open your Bible to Deuteronomy 10. Um, when we read together, though, for this first passage, I'd like you to read it off the screen as we read together because I believe I use the NIV translation. So I don't want to get anybody confused. So let's read this first one off the screen together. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. So what God says here is, he says, hey, I love the foreigner that lives among you. And you know what? You are to lo love the foreigner too. And then God's love that he declares here, he put into action. And if you look back on the screen, you can see the action. It said that he defends the cause, or in other words, other translations say he gives justice to the foreigner. So he does that. He gives them a home, a place to live. He gives them food, it says up there. He gives them clothing. He gives them really everything they need. He says, welcome, welcome to my family. God loves the foreigner. And that's a good thing, you know, because you and I were once foreigners. And that's what our second reading for today is about. It tells us that. I'd like us to read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. We read together. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Boy, so this passage says, hey, you were once separated, you were once excluded, you were once foreigners without hope and without God. Now, without God doesn't mean that God wasn't here. It means that they had rejected him, and so in their relationship, they did not have God as a part of that. So that's what that talks about. And then, yet, through Jesus, we are now one with Christ and citizens of his kingdom. And by the way, that's the first time I've used the word yet in this sermon today, right? So we're separated, we were born excluded as foreigners, without hope, without God, yet, even though that is a given, through Jesus, we're now one with Christ and citizens of his kingdom. Yet, you see, is God's response to sin, to death, and to the devil. It's the bottom line. It's the last word. It's the final say. All of that from that word yet. I hoard my time, my talents, and my treasures. Yet, Jesus sacrificed his time, his talent, and his treasures for me. I am a sinner. Yet, Jesus became sin for me. I deserve God's temporal and eternal punishment. We confess that, right? Yet, Jesus took my punishment for me. I deserve death, yet Jesus died for me. I was separated, excluded, a foreigner, yet Jesus made me a member of his kingdom. You are a citizen of God's kingdom, yet you're a citizen in the world, right? We live in this world, right? Not of it, and so as we live in this world, we are affected by sin and all of its consequences, including death. And of course, with that old Adam still in us, we sin too. We will sin this side of heaven. But remember this, you're a sinner, yet 
God has made you a saint through Christ. You may feel guilty, yet God declares you not guilty through the blood of Christ. You may deserve hell. In fact, I'll make it, I'll make it uh, a statement. You deserve hell, yet heaven is your home through Jesus. You often fail to love others, yet God loves you in Christ. You may fail to forgive others, yet God forgives you in Christ. You may fail to accept others, yet God accepts you, sinner that you are, through Jesus. You may fail to sacrifice for others, yet God sacrificed through you in Christ. And I know as you go through this life, there will be times when you'll feel unloved, yet God loves you through Jesus. There will be times in this life where you're going to feel like no one cares at all, yet God cares for you. There'll be times in this life when you feel alone, yet Jesus is with you always to the very end of the age. He will never leave you or forsake you. There are times when you may feel weak, yet you're strong through the power that God supplies through his word and his sacraments. And there are times in this life when you may feel unaccepted, yet God accepts you through faith in Jesus. The scripture says you were once far away, yet God brought you near through the blood of Christ, through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for you. And so I want to encourage you today, respond to Jesus sacrificing for you by sacrificing for others, others especially who are far away so that they may be brought near through the blood of Christ. And sacrifice your time and your skills and your riches to those especially outside his kingdom. You know, we have wonderful opportunities to do that here at Bethany. You know, we have Servant Saturday coming up um, this, this coming Saturday. And we still have some need to be able to help those um, that have that need. And I, one thing I'd like to mention to you for sure is uh, the family of faith out there at St. John in Garfield Heights. They're having a 170th birthday party. They've been together 170 years. And so they're going to be having many visitors coming back. And yet their grounds uh, need some help. And so we need some people to go over there and do, you know, just trimming of bushes and, and things like that to get, to get the place looking a little better. And we do have some who have offered to sacrifice their time next Saturday, but we still could use a few more people. So prayerfully consider that. What's a wonderful opportunity. Another opportunity that we have, and we'll talk about it a little more, is, is our Stephen Ministry Program. It's a program that's been going on here for uh, six years now. It's helped many, many people who are going through difficult times. And, and we, have, um, we have Stephen Ministers that are there to provide one-on-one -on -one Christian care for people. And we have a need right now, and, and the need is for more Stephen ministers because we've had so many people who have really been going through a difficult time and, and really have wanted a one-on-one -on -one Christian caring relationship to get through that difficult time. So please consider that ministry as we talk about it more later in the service. And we have a table set up in the back as well if you uh, care to learn more about that ministry um, from either side, whether you're one who might uh, need and want some care, or if you're someone you who feels God is gifted to be a good listener and have a real heart for people, um, sounds like God may be leading you to be a Stephen minister, so you can find out more at the table in the back. Also, Bethany Lutheran School, what a wonderful way to sacrifice for those outside the faith. As we've learned, we, we have many children that are now part of our school that have no church home, and 
many who have never even been exposed to Jesus. What a wonderful opportunity we have to sacrifice for them so that they might be brought near through the blood of Jesus. And so as you go out and you seek to sacrifice for others, especially those outside the faith, you can tell them, hey, I'm a sinner, yet through Jesus' death, I'm a saint. And Jesus can do the same thing for you. You can say, even though one day I'll die, yet shall I live. And Jesus can do that for you too. You can say, I was once a slave to sin, yet Jesus set me free. And he can do the same thing for you. I was once lost, yet Jesus found me can do the same thing for you. I was once a foreigner, yet Jesus made me a member of his family, and he can do that for you too. Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And given that love is an action and that that action involves sacrifice, he could have said, as I have sacrificed for you, so you must sacrifice for one another. Bethany, let's, let's call out. Give me your tired. Give me your poor. Give me your huddled masses. And call that out, not for our country, but for our congregation, for God's kingdom. Let's sacrifice for them as Jesus sacrificed for us. God grants it for Jesus' sake. Amen.